Oh la. Ye humble host has returned after a long siesta. So, I want to start knocking out some content. I've been waylaid by a lot of various uh, issues to do with my day job and also my health. Uh, we'll get into that in another video. Um, right now, I'm chilling in one of my favorite spots to shoot. Uh, I'm watching the incredible 1977 documentary Punk in London. Uh, and if that makes you think I may be doing a punk rock video uh, of some kind, or video on some kind of punk rock stuff soon, you're right. But not tonight. So, uh, my first video I want to get out of the way tonight because I'm in need uh, of uh, financial assistance. I, I have a huge property tax to pay and I'm trying to lose my house because they'll put a lien on it by around June if I don't get it. To them uh, and now it's uh, almost April 1st so I have none of the money for it it's $1,400 I have been raising uh, money via fundraisers uh, through uh, GoFundMe through YouTube and also I'm taking direct donations uh, via PayPal all that information is in the description below please check it out uh, please consider helping me out all that has basically been able to keep my media bills off my back to clear the way, clear the path to save for this $1,400. Um, but the bills keep piling up. So I, I'm I'm in okay shape right now, but uh, I was just cut back to one day a week, six hours uh, at my job. And that's like a permanent downsizing after being there almost three years. So I kind of mentioned that stuff was coming in my last video, I think. So it has happened. Uh, I'll do more about it later. Um, but suffice to say, and between that and my weak uh, eBay sales, uh, I have basically been depending on whatever trickling fundage comes in, some from my day job, some from a little bit of eBay, and then from my donations. And I've been really grateful and thankful to you people. Uh, I wanted to thank two special people real quick uh, for donating to me um, because they're very noteworthy people. Uh, and I'm very humbled uh, by their um, their caring and their attention. Um, and yes, I'm going to get to the point of the video, which has to do with me selling stuff to raise money. It's going to be all about my eBay channel. But let me thank these two wonderful ladies first. Um, both of them are wonderful women who have played key roles in the lives and work of Two of my all-time favorite comic book writers uh, who are both unfortunately now deceased both of whom i was able to know before they died one only very slightly the other somewhat more uh and both of them worked on the same marvel comic series As a matter of fact one succeeded the other on the said series in the 1970s that was called the defenders now the defenders has no real relation to the iteration that's on you know, it's just been uh, finally put onto Disney Plus in a brave move. They've defied the parental groups and the censors, the uh, almighty censors of Disney's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the moral arbiters who don't want to have uh, adult content side by side with their Avengers Endgame and their Mandalorian. Um, well, too bad, man. It's happened. The Netflix shows are in the MCU. For those who don't know this, the Netflix shows are in the MCU officially uh, as part of their canon, it seems as though, and they're on their channels. Everything on their channel is in their canon, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions as far as what happened in the MCU. And, of course, evidence of that has been, uh, lately has been appearances by some characters in the so-called Defenderverse or Netflixverse uh Matt Murdock and Wilson Fisk uh, in some MCU television shows on Disney Plus. And I've covered all that stuff extensively on this channel, probably too extensively. Y'all are probably sick of hearing me talk about Marvel Comics. Well, I have bad news. I'm going to be doing more comics related videos, just comics related, talking about comics, reviewing uh, graphic novels. So that's on the slate. You knew it was coming. But you guys who watch my stuff for music, movies, and news, uh, you're probably sick of me hearing about Marvel stuff unless you're into that. And I totally get it. But I'm not going to, you know, uh, expound on all that. I just want to thank um, Mary Screens, uh, a very kind woman who is a very essential member of my 
uh, Steve Gerber RIP Facebook group. It was a group I inherited. I didn't create it, but it was originally called Steve Gerber. And then I had been in slight touch with him on and off through the years. Not much. Tried to get an interview once, and um, you know he was gracious to grant it, but I didn't really have my stuff together to do it. This was way back, like 1999. Um, and, and then he had a uh, Yahoo group and everybody, you know, in the 2000s. Uh, he run, ran, and uh, I was a member of that, and, and you know, occasionally I'd interact in, in passing with him. I don't think I ever made a really great um, impression, um, but I will say, um, I will say that, um, sorry, I just got a weird notification I had to, to pay attention to, uh, to do with one of my groups. Um, yeah, I went all over the map. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I was going to say is, uh, before, right around the time he passed, I had joined this group, and I had noticed it was kind of in flux, and it ended up somehow without a an owner, and there was a chance to apply and become an owner, kind of take over the group by doing, I forgot how you do it now, I don't know if you can still do this. I've done it to two groups, and they weren't hostile takeovers, they were lost groups, and they were the first groups of their kinds devoted to these respective figures. One was Steve Gerber, and one was called John Bushima Powell. So John Bushima Powell was a rather large group, and it is a very large and growing group that I now own and uh, maintain, moderate, administrate, control, whatever, um, and uh, growing by the day. Uh, that was one that was orphaned. Now, I'm a big John Bushima fan, but I'm a much bigger Steve Gerber fan, and so Sometime before this John Bashima thing happened, I had the opportunity to take over the Steve Gerber group. So it was shortly after he passed, uh, I renamed it Steve Gerber RIP, and, I, and the group descriptions, which you can't really read those old group descriptions uh, because the well, formats have changed in the Facebook groups. But I made lists of characters and concepts Steve had either created or co-created over the years. I invited other people to add them to it as long as they were accurate. Uh, and in compiling it, I myself was really impressed. So some of my friends joined. There are already some people in the group. There are a few comics pros in the group or people that knew Steve, but not too many. Uh, so I just started promoting the group, and but I more or less let it take care of itself. Um, I, I don't do a lot of hands-on administrating of those groups uh, because people are generally well-behaved and know what they're talking about. Lately, I've had to do a few on, on the uh on the Steve Gerber group itself, unfortunately, but that was taken care of. That's the only real incident I've had. Uh, I try to keep that drama down and the trolls, like, out. Um, I've been administrating groups online for 15 years, at least, so I know what I'm doing by now, I hope. Um, but after a while, the Steve Gerber group grew, and people that he knew more uh, intimately, like his daughter joined, uh, and Mary Screens, who had been a collaborator and close friend, uh, over the years with him, I would co-created and co-written the Omega the Unknown series for Marvel in the 70s, one of Steve's greatest creations, uh, period, especially for Marvel. Definitely, I think his most idiosyncratic creation for Marvel, very subversive uh, way way to do a superhero, kind of like doing a superhero as though he were writing Howard the Duck. And then in a way, you know, when he's writing Howard the Duck, he's writing an animated duck as though he's writing a, a Marvel Universe character, sort of. I don't know. I mean... The lines blur, uh, you know, he was able to create his own world and yet still honor the world of the Marvel Universe back when it had some kind of relevance. I don't see that it does per se now, maybe in movies, but not in actual comics. At least it seems to have no relevance to the people actually writing Marvel comics, and put it that way. Um, so yeah, I was honored to see Steve's daughter and uh, Mary Screens join the group. Uh, I didn't really interact with them. Um, Don McGregor, who I already knew pretty well from corresponding with him, being friends with him on Facebook, he joined. It was very nice to see him there, and eventually a lot of other artists and writers started joining on. The John Bashima group has kind of exploded with comics pros, and I don't interact with them a whole lot, um, but I, I'm, I'm honored to have them there. I know they're big fans of John, and I hope the people in the Steve Gerber group, I'm pretty sure, are really big fans of Steve. But I did have to boot out some people at one point who were kind of uh, just spreading misinformation, I know we're sick of hearing that phrase, uh, about Steve and about Mary and uh, their lives and works, just disrespectful and kind of 
uh, instead of depicting their struggles uh, at Marvel against people like Jim Shooter, uh, from their point of view, they were uh, portraying events from the point of view of Jim Shooter, uh, who I'm a strong uh, detractor of, for the record, if that's not clear already from other videos. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, I just said, you know, I, I said something to these people. I booted them out. I made a pinned post, and I, I basically said, you know, Mary Screens is here in the group. You know, please respect her. Uh, please respect Steve. If you're not, if you don't respect them, what's the point of you being here? Uh, and if you want to go and find groups on the internet, online, where you can, and I put put it in crude terms, you can basically fellate or sexually gratify Jim Shooter and his monstrous ego. By all means, there's tons of forums to do that. Um, and this, this Steve Gerber group is absolutely not one of them. Uh, Steve's stance on creators' rights and uh, his ideology as a creator, what I get gleaned from his work and from interviews with him and talking to people who knew him, more so now I have the group, uh, is that you know, he was an independent-minded guy. Steve Gerber was a, a corporate shill who wanted to control uh, everybody and uh, make his own... Uh, aesthetic judgments on their work like gene colon can't draw so you know i just say fuck you jim shooter i just want to get that out of the way i don't support you i have another jim shooter story i'll tell another time um so mary screens i got to know her a little after that she was just thankful that i defended her and we occasionally exchange like some likes or reacts um she reached out to me when i put up my fundraiser uh, my facebook fundraiser and asked what my PayPal address was, and she made a, a nice, generous donation. I was kind of floored, but in a good way. And then we texted a bit back and forth, uh, getting to know each other a little better, and I'm really grateful to her, and, and that meant a lot to me. Um, yesterday, I received a, a nice donation from Jennifer Bush Craft, who I'm friends with on Facebook now. Uh, I don't know her real well, but she was the wife of David Anthony Craft, one of my favorite comic book writers. He... I first learned of him by name when he um, took over the Defenders from Steve Gerber uh, in the mid-70s. And I think he's next to Steve, the best Ger Defenders scribe there was. He's a word that he himself used a lot. Dave did a lot of behind-the-scenes work for Marvel, a lot of promotional stuff for Marvel he never got credit for. Uh, you know, he was instrumental with Boom Magazine, which was kind of Marvel's own fan magazine, which I actually subscribed to well, my, with my parents' help when I was... Uh, four years old or something, <laughs> and they sent me a giant Jim Steranko poster of all the heroes, but uh, Dave and some other key people like Patty, uh, Dave Cockrum's wife, uh, and you know, were involved with that. Um, but yeah, it was really the Defenders, and then his work on Man Wolf, I read that too. Uh, later, he was the early writer to take over She-Hulk after Stanley had co-created the character, um, and he unlocked, he was actually the first person to introduce the weird kind of uh, metatextual humor into She-Hulk. John Byrne gets all the credit for that because he did the fourth wall stuff all the time, uh, and uh, which is some of his better uh, art and layout, I have to say. I didn't really care for the, the, the scripting, per se, but I thought there were, there were clever visual things going on. Um, but Dave really started that. He brought Howard the Duck as a guest star into She-Hulk and also Valkyrie and Hellcat from the Defenders and... Uh, made up some interesting homage characters like Nosferatu, the, the She-Bat, I believe he created her. Uh, maybe that was Steve Gerber. That's right. I'm getting confused. Steve Gerber took over She-Hulk, too, later. Okay, so Dave began with the parody stuff, and I think he's the one who had the Defenders guest star. But yes, later Steve Gerber had a little run on She-Hulk and created Nosferatu, the She-Bat, and um, brought in Howard the Duck for a little bit. And those elements were later used by Dan Slott in a really good run, which I think is going to kind of be the basic foundation of this uh, Disney Plus She-Hulk series that's launching soon. Sorry I confused the work of these two great guys, but they're working in the same, you know, uh, the same toy box, sandbox, what have you. Um, but anyway, Dave passed away a few months ago. Now, I had met Dave years ago at a Heroes Con, and of course, I got him to sign a bunch of my Defenders, which I still have. Now, I'm not signed, now I'm not selling those. Um... And got them talking to him about Bloister, Cole, and Rush, two bands that he 
uh, got me interested in and that he talked about and uh, were influenced by on his early Defender story. Uh, and it was great, you know, because I was getting into, you know, I, I was in the rock by that time, but I can't remember if I was really deep into Boyster Cult or not. Uh, I liked Black Sabbath. I was intrigued by metal. It may have been after high school. It may have been during high school. Uh, I'm not sure. I guess I was just, you know, beginning to get into that. So he gave me a lot of um, encouragement and, and explained a lot of the references to the songs that were in the comics, um, many from the album Agents of Fortune and other works. Uh, yeah, that's, again, a topic for another time, maybe a Defenders video uh, to decipher all that. But anyway, I met him online years later, and he actually did remember me, albeit vaguely. And we had a common friend, C. Lou Disharoon, who was working with me on a kind of Defenders-influenced webcomic, pastiche comic called Conclaves. Um, and he got to know Dave really well, uh, and they became very close. And, uh, you know, Dave uh, got married to a young lady, Jennifer Bush, and um, sadly not a tremendously long amount of time, certainly not never long enough, uh, after they were married, uh, Dave passed away, and I was kind of in shock, and I, I reached out to Jennifer, I, I sent her a friend request, and I, you know, just sent my condolences, and she had noted that she really was just starting to realize how many people's lives Dave had touched uh, back in the 70s and 80s with his comics work, and how, you know, we're all adults now, and we're all still talking about it, talking about Dave, we were talking to Dave, and honoring him uh, as more and more of his accomplishments uh, came to the fore. And there are a lot, there are too many to name. I mean, he was instrumental in a lot of behind the scenes, creative and editorial activity and ideas and concepts uh, with all of Marvel from Stan Lee to Jim Shooter all the way down, people that he was giving ideas to, working with Roy Thomas, people like that, uh, that he has never really gotten credit for, that he has pr produced the work and the evidence of that work uh, on his Facebook page. Uh, and it's fascinating. Some of it I knew just because I've always been a geek for, you know, useless ephemera. Not useless to me, but useless to most people. Um, but a lot of it I learned. Uh, and so yesterday I was honored that Jennifer Bushcraft, uh, David's widow, um, you know, uh, bequeathed me with a donation to help me out uh, and expressed uh, 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 admiration for my cat. He always gets the most uh, likes. He's like the superstar of my whole operation. He's the mascot. He's the, you know, he's what draws them in, man. You know, he's like the spokesmodel, the sex symbol. I just do the work, you know. But he reaps the rewards. Um, so, yeah. And then I had him comment on my eBay. I mean, I said that he liked my eBay store sale, too, just to get a plug because I knew he'd get attention more than my normal posts would. Uh, but Cal will always be the, the number one draw for me, my, my kitty. I don't know where he went. I thought he was going to co-star. But... So let's get to the point of this now that we've, we've talked for a while. But I just wanted to thank those two people a lot and their connections to people that influenced me and, and were, were a great solace to me in my very lonely childhood. I know you're getting up the violin and everything. Uh that the, there's a connection there and that the, they appreciate the fact that I got what those gentlemen were doing and and I appreciate the fact that they were connected to those gentlemen and uh, it, it's a deep kind of profound thing, you know. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. But that was the highlight of my week and I really appreciate the help. It has helped me quite a bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in my eBay store because I'm going to promote the hell out of this. Uh, I may do more videos like this, but this one I'm going to go all out for. So this could end up being a long video. Hopefully not, but we'll see. So, what am I selling? I just want to talk about some exciting things that I'm selling. Uh, everything on my in my store is on sale right now. Everything is best offer. Uh, now, it's best reasonable offer. You know, if somebody sees a $100 item and, and sends me an offer for $20, you know, I will automatic, I've programmed it to automatically reject such a thing. And that happens daily. You know, people send me insultingly low offers constantly. I don't know if they think I'm just going to, 
go, oh, oh, there's an offer. Okay, cool. And then just hit it and then and then later go, wait a minute. Um, you know, but I guess it can't it can't hurt to try, but sometimes they're kind of insulting. You know, like I've had a dollar offers for a hundred dollar items before, and I, I I guess they're pranking me. I don't know. But anyway, so here's some items. And let's talk about the videos first. So this is a movie. I think I talked about this in another. I may have showed some of these off in another video, but you really can't get enough of this stuff, can you? Um, I can't. I'm just kidding. Uh, Female Yakuza Tail with Rego Ike. Uh, this is a uh, Pinky uh, film, uh, Pinky Violence Collection by Panic House. These are out of print. This has a little, a little see-through slip cover. These are very graphic samurai revenge films like lady snowblood which itself is very gory uh these are kind of like a little more tasteless a little bit more erotica and nudity she's fighting nude in the snow a lot you know so here's the sequel sex and fury which co-stars christina lindberg the famous star of thriller cruel picture which i did two videos about and which are some of my more popular videos i'm selling these for i think currently around 75 to 80 dollars each uh, which is cheaper than they, the fair market value currently is. Here's another expensive uh, movie. Uh, this is a rare DVD, Dirty Duck. Now, this is a film that came out in the 70s. Uh, it was kind of in the wake of Fritz the Cat, the work of Ralph Bakshi. They wanted to do an adult one. And these are the people who did the cartoon, um, The Point, which was very popular with kids, you know, with all the songs, like Me and My Arrow. And, uh, and they decided to do a tasteless adult one. Uh, and they called it Dirty Duck, and basically they ripped off the uh, underground comics artist, writer, uh, Bobby London. He had one called Dirty Duck that ran occasionally in Playboy magazine. So this has nothing to do with that. He went to court and told them to stop promoting it as Dirty Duck. The actual title of the movie is Down in Dirty Duck. Now, this DVD came out a little bit before Bobby London had been uh, brought people up to full awareness of everything on the Internet. So if it's just a, this ever gets re-released, it'll probably be called Down and Dirty Duck, you know, in the actual uh, materials. This is rare. Uh, I'm selling this, I can't think currently, for $85 or $90. Uh, the tagline on Dirty Duck is, Madder than Daffy, Dumber than Donald, More Existential than Howard. Uh, I love this movie. It's totally, it's totally insane. It, you know, some people like Flo and Eddie, who worked with Frank Zappa, did music and voices, um, you know, and uh, I don't know, man. It, it, uh, Charles Swenson is the guy who, who wrote, directed, and animated. I, he later went on to do, do the Rugrats. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a product of its time. Juvenile fun. Please buy it. Okay, so I have a, a couple of collections here. I think, again, these are some ones I've talked about before. But I just want to run through them real quick because of the fact that they're pretty comprehensive and they make a great collection for anybody so i'm selling all of my shaw brothers uh collection um i have uh these are all in very good to like new condition um and these are from the classic shaw brothers period i believe all these except one are put out by dragon dynasty which put out the celestial celestial pictures and dragon dynasty put out the shaw brothers classic collection on dvd these are all now out of print I have the One-Armed Swordsman, a Wu Sha film from 1967 with Jimmy Wang Yu. This is a classic. This is an incredibly influential film and groundbreaking. I uh, love it. This has uh, got uh, my Facebook friend, Hao Young Ching, uh, under his name, Sisao Liao. I can't say his name correctly, uh, but he starred in this Mad Mon Monkey Kung Fu. This is kind of a cult favorite. It's more of a humorous later one. I think I'm selling this for around $15. Uh, this one I still have with slipcase. It got a little dust on it. Uh, Return to the 36th Chamber, as in 36th Chamber of Shaolin. Uh, Gordon Liu, this is another classic. Uh, yeah, it still has a slip cover. Everything's in great condition. Right now I'm selling this for 30, but I'm going to start bringing it down. Um, Golden Swallow, uh, which also has Jimmy Yang Wang Yu, but stars Chang Pei Pei, or Pei Pei Ching, uh, the star of. Uh, Come Drink With Me. This is the Shaw Brothers sequel to Come Drink With Me. Uh, and uh, Come Drink With Me is a classic King Hu film uh, of the Wuxia genre, which, you know, Wuxia is sword play and, you know, jumping through the trees and everything like a crouching tiger. It's become part of the 
film vocabulary now. Uh, 20 years ago, you know, but not so much, but, you know, Hollywood started uh, hiring people like Yoon, Yoon, Wing, Yoon, Yoon Wing Po, Yoon Po, I'm not going to get his name right, he's one of the Yoon family, he's famous stunt man, and he worked on all, a lot of these films, and he worked on Crouching Tiger and on X-Men, and he kind of helped popularize a lot of that movement, and then, of course, Zhang Yimou did his own kind of trilogy of wuxia films, uh, um, I'm not going to get these in order, but uh, Curse of the Golden Flower, which is the least lesser one of the three. I sold that. Hero, uh, which I have sold. That's the greatest of the three in the first. Um, and then, of course, uh, House of Flying Daggers, which I recently sold for $250. Um, this, I think, is going for around 12 And here is the actual comb drink with me itself, with Chang Pei Pei on the cover. Um, her character's name, Golden Sparrow. So that was like her spinoff movie. But this was done by King Hu himself. Uh, she's gorgeous. She was in Crouching Tiger, too, as, as the jaded fox or whatever. Uh, great film. This is being re-released on, e uh, on eBay. On Blu-ray. Uh, very soon. Uh, by Arrow. I think it's coming out any time now. It may already have just come out. Uh, another one I can't afford, but if you want to gift it to me to the channel to review, more power to you, because I would love to have a copy. It's not in the Shaw Scope box sets that are coming out. Which I own the first one. I was donated that by a channel patron, and I reviewed it. Uh, but I un did an unboxing and talked about it uh, in a previous video. So come drink with me, I think around $12. Uh, another one with Chang Pei Pei, The Lady Hermit. Well, this is done by Funimation, a different company. And this has just tons of this classic martial arts iconography. This cat with the, the clawed fingers. I love this stuff. And you guys know that from my Charlescope video. Uh, this, I think I'm selling for 40 This is pretty rare. King Boxer. I think I'm doing about 10 to 15 on this. Uh, five Fingers of Death. I upgraded this. Uh, it, I was, it, was, it was upgraded for me uh, when I received the Charlescope box. Uh, this was the very first movie in it. A diagram pole fighter, complete with slip cover, which is a little damaged, but everything else that's here is like new. Uh, another classic by Gordon Liu, also out of print. I think I'm doing like eight on this. It's not worth really all that much right now. So I'm going to put these incredible films aside. Last little bunk batch of films is all by the same director. Uh, one of my very favorite uh, Japanese directors, Yasuzo Masumura. I have for sale Giants and Toys. Uh, I'm selling this for, I believe, I think all of these, uh, except, well, two of these I'm selling for around 10 to 12 bucks. They're really going down in value for whatever reason. This was upgraded. Arrow put this on Blu-ray as well. I'd love to get that also. So I'm selling mine, uh, and it's not really going for a lot right now. Incredible film, by the way. 1958 Technicolor film. Strong parody of commercialism and uh, pop culture. Uh, and corporate corporations uh, exploiting those things. I can't rave about this movie really enough. It's one of my favorite movies, and uh, I'm excited to see the Blu-ray. But you know, this has got to go. I, I got I got to eat. So, I highly recommend this. I mean, this is incredibly ahead of its time, for real. And uh, I just can't stop watching. It. I can't believe it's made in 1958 in Japan because everything it's saying. It's very endemic to Japan, but it is really a lot about how American culture itself was exploding during that period and the crass commercialism of it and the, the, the ubiquitous nature and how it kind of permeated the whole planet post-World War II. And Japan was emulating it. You know, this is like a, a battle between two companies over their caramel candies, <laughs> their ad campaigns, which feature this strange chick they pull off the street and she wears a space-age garb. And it just gets weirder and funnier and romantic. A good companion piece is Black Test Car by the same director, black and white film. Also brilliant. This is an industrial espionage film about the uh, making of a, of a and special, uh, you know, top of the line kind of jet set space age uh, automobile. I mean, this is great. This is like for my dad's generation because he drove those kind of cars in the 50s. And it, it's just... Again, it's got humor and romance and intrigue, but it's about what some people might consider a banal subject. Uh, and this guy made it brilliant. He made it fascinating, entertaining, insightful. Great satire from 1962. 
also upgraded. I really need to get that upgrade whenever I can, whenever the fates decree. All right, now these two are going to be a bit pricier. This one's Red Angel, also by Yasuza Masamura. And this is the most grim uh, anti-war film I've seen in my entire life. It was almost impossible to get through one viewing. I know that doesn't sound like a good way to promote it for you guys to buy it. Um, it's filmmaker Mark Savage, independent filmmaker I know on Facebook. Uh, really cool guy I've interacted with. Has great taste in films and has made a great deal of films himself in recent years. And some are distributed by Unearthed Films. Another company I recommend, I know the owners, uh, Steve Biro and uh, his assistant, uh, the incredible Susie Ayala. Or creepy Susie, she's amazing, a friend of mine, and Mark has worked with them. Uh, Mark promoted this as one of his favorite films, uh, and it was nice to see that because I don't know if anyone else even cared about this movie. Even Masamura fans I've talked to haven't either haven't seen it. Because see, Fantoma did six of his movies at one time. This was Fantoma was the bomb, yo, and they're out of business now. I mean, they did the Great Silence, they did the Coffin Joe trilogy box set. Uh, they did Fondo and Lease by uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky. I mean, they had an amazing lineup, and they did six movies by this nearly forgotten cat, Masamura. Now, the ones I don't own, uh, or did they do five? Five or six? Oh, my God, I'm going to get it wrong. Okay, well, I'll say this. They did one called Manji. Now, Manji is the name of, I think, a character in the movie, but Manji is a swastika, uh, uh, one that's going to the left, the original uh, Eastern swastika, not the shitty one that the Nazis turned around and ruined for everybody, but the beautiful symbol that it was. And that's what a manji is. Uh, it's also called a Gamadian in some cultures, uh, which I have a character in my story named Gamadian that's named after him. He's not a Nazi, but he's kind of that, 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 that anyway. That's too complicated for now. Um, but manji I never bought. I have seen it. Uh, and maybe it was only five. Uh, I keep thinking over six titles, but in five are incredible still. So anyway, this one is black and white. It's 1966. It's relentlessly downbeat. Uh, basically, this cat without arms, uh, you know, is in this vet hospital. And this kind of sweet angel mercy nurse is really like affected by these people. And she bonds with him and she sneaks him out of the hospital and they go on a date and she has sex with him so he can have sex because he can't masturbate. And then she tells him basically, you know, we can't do this again. And, uh, but not in the way you would think in an American film. Like we'll never, we can never see each other like this again. Not like this, you know, kind of like in, uh, Titans when Hawk and Dove hooked up or, um, in dead zone when, <laughs> when Johnny and Sarah hooked up, am I going to see you again? Not like today, Johnny. You know, and that's kind of like that. But anyway, then it goes downhill and more grim from there. $50. I, I brought it down. I, I hate to part with it. I might part with it for 40 And this one is worth a lot. Afraid to Die? I need 60 An incredible Yakuza noir film by Yamasimura. In bright color, starring Yukio Mishima, a great a classic, towering author in Japanese literature. Uh, as a Yakuza, this insecure, kind of weird, nerdy Yakuza guy, and his story really touches you. I mean, by the end of the movie, it's just got the, one of those tragic stories where the hero almost makes it to the end. They almost get out of the, the, the bad life. They almost get redemption. You know, not everybody gets away like in Superfly, you know, and gets his way to Europe with the woman and the money, you know, and... Uh, Nobody does this kind of shit better than the Japanese because they always have the sad song playing in the, at the end. So, man, I love this movie. This has not been upgraded. Neither has Red Angel. I'm just praying they will be. They are on Tubi. I think you can watch all these movies on Tubi for free, so do it. I'm going for, I think, 70 on this now. I think I brought it down to 70. It was fair market value. was 100 when I put it up for sale, so it might come down a little on that. So that's the DVDs. I don't know if I have time for everything else, but we're going to dip into some stuff that's kind of fun, I hope. It could be deadly dull for you guys. Rocky Squirrel. Rocket J Squirrel, staple of Rocky and Bullwinkle, the more intelligent of the two partners. Uh, Ash, why he gets first billing, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle's the sidekick, not vice versa. 
the Bull Weekly gets all the love. Rocky, however, is the brilliant aviator. This is here in his aviator helmet and his Rocket J Squirrel t-shirt in beautiful purple and lavender. He is in almost mint condition. Look at that tail, man. Look at that tail action. I love this guy. I don't want to sell him. I'm currently selling him for 35 I don't know if I'd go below 30 Uh I'm even tempted to raise the price so I can keep it longer. But I need to sell him. Give him a good home. Give Rocky a good home. $35. Think about it. I have a rare book here. A Princess of Mars. This was given to me by a uh, old friend who fell out with me because his wife uh, didn't like the fact that I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, but they gave this to me for a birthday gift or an anniversary gift. I don't remember which one. And they got it really inexpensively. And then I found out it was worth quite a bit. I mean, I wanted to keep it forever. This has the J. John St. Allen or whatever the guy's name is. This guy's illustrations for these early Barsoom Mars uh, stories and novels by Edgar Rice Burroughs are just amazing. John Carter's always had great illustrations from the, this guy down to Frazetta in the 60s and then the Michael Whelan paperbacks in the 70s and 80s. The Marvel comic with Gil Kane and Rudy Nebry's art. That was just... I've got a complete run of those. I'm not, I'm not selling them. Um, though there is an omnibus of them out there somewhere. If I could ever get this cheap, I'd, cheap, I'd sell them. But this was the first novel in the Mars series. Um, I originally sold this for $150. I brought it down to $120. Uh, I will, full disclosure, I sold it to a gentleman. I didn't package it the way he liked. Now, this is the almost exact condition as I sold it to him. However... In the mail, and this was my fault, I, I admit it, it got this ding here, okay? And it got this ding here, and another little ding there. This guy absolutely lost his freaking shit on me. He sent me a torrent of nasty, hostile uh, emails. He sent it back to me, of course, at my expense, which originally I, uh, I was not going to do, but he kind of like got an eBay on my ass. I sent it, he sent it back to me at my expense. He packaged it really well and, and even left a note in there telling me, this is how you package a valuable book, dude. He was like, I can't believe you would do that, engage in this reprehensible behavior as a dealer for a $120 item. Look at this ding, damn it. You know, and he sent me like 25 photos and he was constantly berating me. I never responded. Not once did I respond. I, I, I paid the postage. I got it, you know in the mail from him and then I refunded him and then I was like I can sell this what the fuck because at the time this book was going this book was going for like 150 to 175 he got it for 120 uh but he said because of the dings I should have he should have gotten it for a lot less but the dings really bothered him I understand it was a lesson for me I do pack my vintage books a few I have and I will package this one. I'm doing $10 in postage. It's going in a box. It's going to be wrapped in bubble wrap. It's going to be absolutely impenetrable. It's going to have like an adamantium sheath over it. And, and he won't even be able to open it. He'll be like this box with Princess of Mars. You know, some fetishist collectors are like this. I've never been quite that in bonkers, but I have had friends who were, so, you know, no, no judgment. Anyway, I'm at, I was asking for 120 when I put it back up for sale. Now I'm asking 105. I think I'm willing to go down to about maybe 90, uh, maybe lower, maybe if you're if you really want it. Got this valuable comic book. This is Taboo Number Three from the Swing in 1980s, published by Stephen R. Bissett, who came to prominence as the artist on Swamp Thing, along with John Toddleman uh, and writer Alan Moore. All of these guys ended up contributing to his really adult. Nasty, grungy horror. I think Clyde Barker depict, uh, contributed at some point to this, but it's very Clyde Barker influenced stuff. It's of that same era. Uh, this particular issue features Rick Grimes, uh, Tim Lucas, writer of Video Watchdog, his novella Throat Sprockets. He first did as a comic book, serialized in here with great art by Mike Hoffman. Uh, Rick Beach, who took over Swamp Thing from Moore and, and Bissett Donovan. Uh, is in here, of course, and uh, Lynn Dakin, some people I'm not that familiar with, uh, Bernie Moreau, uh, Jack Vanuker, and S.R. Bissett himself. Uh, and then there's a little story called A State of Darkness, which is the second chapter 
of From Hell by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell. Um, that's the inside back cover is the From Hell. So this is this chapter two of the original serial first printing of From Hell. So I put this up for about 85. Right now I've got it down to 75. I will take lower offers. And this nice little thing came my way via inheritance of sorts. This is the Prince of Darkness, not Prince of Darkness. Whoops! I already sold the Prince of Darkness. Death Waltz Records did a series of soundtracks of 80s horror movies. And I, I ended up with two, and one was Prince of Darkness. I sold that one for around 60 a while back. Um, I also ended up with a Twin Peaks one that I just recently sold. Uh, the guy, the guy uh, bartered me down to $45. Uh, I sent it in a box, and he loved it. He gave me an incredible review. So this one right now I have up for 70 but I'm going to go best off or lower. I doubt I'll go below 50 but you never know. This is the season of The Witch, Halloween 3 soundtrack. I know it's shiny. It's hard to see. I don't really want to take it out, but just because I love you guys, I'll try. So this is it, man. There goes the bag. It's still in this bag. See, it's, it's hardly been opened. I don't even know if it's been played. Uh, I don't know that it has been played, but this was left behind by a friend, uh, who, who was going to try to help me out with some money, and who was just like, sell this shit, man. And so uh, that's one of the things I'm selling. Uh, I've sold a lot of the stuff he left in my garage, uh, with his permission, uh, over the last couple of years. This one, the albums have been slow to sell, but now they're starting to pick up. So this is the last one I've got left on vinyl. I think it's uh, two discs. Uh, it's just super deluxe in every way. So... $70. So I'm running out of time by my metric. I'll just start throwing a few comics at you, just some mild highlights, as something Red Video used to say. Some of the milder highlights of this adult film. This is a series by this cat named, named something like Jack Kurtzberg, Jacob Kurtzberg, Jack Kirby, OMAC One Man Army Corps. <laughs> A startling look into the world that's coming. Man, we're here, baby. This is prophetic shit series. This Mohawk genetically engineered warrior of the future, Buddy Blank, becomes OMAC. He becomes a one-man army corps. And he just kind of, it's like a issue-by-issue -issue run through of this fucked-up future world and how, again, consumerism has destroyed everything. The rich, the polit politicians, the military. Look at this issue, issue two. The world is coming, dangerous and exciting. Are you ready for OMAC? In the era of the super rich. This is now, man. This is what we're fucking living. Okay, so these are going for between eight and fifteen dollars. I'm doing number one for ten dollars. Uh I brought that down. Number two, the era of the super rich, I think like I think eight or ten right now, but I might bring it down more. The conditioner isn't as good. Uh, some of them are in really excellent condition, though they're later issues, so they're going for around 12, 15, but I'm gradually dropping all these. Um, I may end up selling them roughly for like seven or eight dollars each. Uh, I don't know if I've sold any of my OMAX that I had on sale. I had the first seven out of eight issues, or six out of seven. I still have them, so I haven't sold any. This is your chance to jump on OMAX, man. Um... I've got a lot of Avengers. We could be here all day on the Avengers, quite frankly. I, I'm going to see if there's any amazing highlights uh, that, that any of you guys would be interested in, especially uh, there is a, a young lady who has started collecting, systematically collecting my Avengers and Thor Silver Age issues. Uh, I've got one here that's uh, one of the classic Neil Adams uh, uh, pre scroll War issues. Uh, this is in really good shape. Uh, yeah, Neil Adams and Tom Palmer. Uh, I think I'm, I think I'm asking for like fifty for this or sixty. Uh, one of them was worth quite a bit because I had quite a, a great condition. It was in great condition. I don't know if I'll encounter that uh, before I go over on my self allotted time frame. This is another one in that series, the Crease Girl War. It's got a Machina cover, but this is Neil Adams on the side. I'm pretty sure I'm doing this for like 60 or 70, but I'm going to start bringing it down. Uh, this one I'm asking $300 for. This is the first appearance of Dane Whitman, who in the next issue became the Black Knight. 
Uh, he was portrayed by Kit Harriman in the Eternals movie. So Black Knight will be a future Avenger. He's going to appear in the Blade film if it ever gets finished. 300. The issue after it, I sold for 500, which really helped me out because I was I was I had some credit card uh, debt and I was getting really messed up. This is a few months ago, and out of the blue, this guy bought issue uh, 48 with Black Knight on the cover uh, for 500, which actually was a bit less than it's going for. I'm uh, this one. I'm asking 154. You wouldn't know it from the cover, but this is the first appearance of the Squadron Supreme, and of course had a, a hit series in the 1980s, which was kind of a postmodern revisionist, deconstructionist superhero uh, story uh, by Marvel, by Mark Greenwald, around the same time Alan Moore was doing Watchmen. Uh, Squadron Supreme didn't seem as radical as Watchmen. It wasn't, but it was very radical for Marvel. Um, and since they weren't very well known, the Squadron Supreme, uh, he had a lot of license to do a lot of crazy shit. He was the first one to do like the, the brainwashing of the other characters to forget something that happened. And one character even used it to get another female team member to fall back in love with him. I mean, there every issue. There's like ethical issues and like, I don't know. I don't have the, the series anymore. I had a few issues and I believe I sold them. I would like to get it collected one day, but... That's their first appearance. They later appeared in Avengers uh, in some issues I'm going to sell on down the line with George Perez, uh, and then in Defenders, and then they had that series. Um, this is one of the Neil Adams, uh, Kree Scroll War. I'm pretty sure I'm doing this for 50. I have a bunch of assorted ones. This one, uh, signed by Roy Thomas, it is uh, Black Panther, joins the Avengers. Uh, and first appearance of the Grim Reaper. The brother of Wonder Man and a persistent foe of the Avengers, an arch foe uh, who got his scythe from Ultron. This is a nice condition. Let me put it back in the bag. But uh, I'm doing 120 uh, on this right now. I just dropped it for 140. Uh, key issue. I've got them, man. I could be here all day. Here's my Avengers, the Neil Adams. I can do. I'm asking a lot of them for. I just want this down to like 80. I had this when I was a kid. My mom bought this issue for me. It's my earliest issue of Avengers. I don't think it lasted very long before it fell apart. So years later, I acquired this one. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of incredible... Uh, first appearance... Uh, I gotta mention this one. First appearance of Hellcat. Nancy Walker as Hellcat. The, the famous TV character enshrined in Jessica Jones series. So that Hellcat fantasy off is quite a bit different. This is the same character. Uh, this one I'm um, asking around 65 right now, which again is a good deal. Uh, Hellcat is uh, not one of Marvel's most popular or well-known characters, but she is a, a memorable and indelible character to those who know her. She's a fan favorite. She's been through a lot. She's died. She's come back to life. She married the son of the devil, and he drove her insane. And, you know, she, she's been through hell literally. This is the first Hellcat. George Perez art. I don't know I'm saying his name. Fine on purpose. Gil Kane cover, it's the Bouncing Beast. Uh, this was a staple of my childhood. I didn't own this when it first came out, but my best friend did. We both collected that run on Avengers, and um, this was this is one of the best ones. Uh, so yeah, like sixty five bucks, but I'll take less. So that's every, a lot of stuff that I've got like out right now. I have a stack of books that I'm getting ready to uh, put up. Uh, I'm preparing the list. I've got. Some vintage new mutants. This is a pre Bill Sienkiewicz art. I have a really classic Avengers issue, one of my favorites that I hate to sell. Issue 113, where the Vision gets attacked by these racists who are trying to kill androids. Well, they're racists in general, but they, they hate mutants, they hate androids, and the fact that mutant and android are having sex, it drives them over the edge. They're like this right wing hate group, you know? Uh, they're like the Proud Boys, but they have bombs strapped to their bodies. And, and the story of which is swearing vengeance because you killed the man I love. This is an early key Wanda Vision issue. I think, I don't know what I'm going to sell it for. I might do 75, but I'll probably go lower. But that's just like my first guess. Uh, I've got some incredible Doctor Stranges written and drawn by Jim Starlin. Uh, I have some New Mutants done by Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, these are classics. Um, I've got a lot of odds and ends. West Coast Avengers number one. I don't know if anyone cares about that anymore. 
That book, uh, a friend of mine is getting into it, though. Uh, I collected it when it first came out. Um, a Doctor Strange issue. These are ones I'm getting right to do. Another Doctor Strange issue. Um, so let me not mix these up too much with the ones I've already listed. So, yeah. I mean, lots more. New Mutants, West Coast Avengers. Uh, all but one issue of the Ron and original series. I had a one through six run that I sold as a set on eBay last year. These are all in mint, near mint condition. Ron is a great book. Another one I don't have collected, but that I've read about 500 million times and, and would gladly do. So that's it, man. That's some of the highlights of my eBay store. Thanks for being patient with me uh, while I went on my kind of usual tangents and stories. I'm going to do some more content heavy, uh, you know, uh, Blue Review, uh, Bottomless Well, other kinds of stuff pretty soon. Got a really special Blue Review I've been trying to work up for weeks. Just about nailed it. But I'll be doing some other stuff in the meantime. I'm excited about the Bottomless Well. I did all these sound tests to see if I could play snippets of the music. Uh, and not enough to be violating copyright. Um, I almost got it perfected. I have a very primitive rig here. But between my cell phone and my webcam laptop, I think I can, in fact, play you some snippets of tunes that are you know, somewhat audible and react to them. You know, everybody loves these reaction videos. You'll love my reactions. These test videos were weird because I didn't even realize I was making these really freaking funny faces listening to some of this music, but it's passionate stuff, man. It, it really deeply affects me, and, and wow, you'll see it on camera, and I'll give you tidbits and uh, nostalgia and, and, and information on these you know, very obscure bands and records, and I'll recommend that you go to YouTube and um, acquire them, depending on what kind of, uh, you know, software you possess. So anyway, take care. I'll be back soon. Thanks so much. Please, my eBay store, the address is below. All this and hundreds of more items, all kinds of stuff. I got Howard the Duck number one. You know, you name it. I got the first appearance of Brother Voodoo. I'm selling for $500. Um... We could go on forever, man. Tons of movies, rare movies, out-of-print movies, uh, toys, uh, other fun items. So anyway, please purchase. I'm in dire need, friends. But in the meantime, I'm here. I'm bloodied but unbound. I love all you guys. And I want this is an homage to the videos I used to do with my ex-wife, you know, where she would hold up the weird stuffed animals. This one doesn't make a sound. But this is Rocky. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye me, please. Rock on.